truly lovely to hear that sound as we try to start our worship service at 11 a.m. with our, our crazy clock behind us, but to hear Newcastle United Methodists' old bell going off across the street, a good thing. Best we can do right now. <coughs> Next week, we hope and pray we'll be hearing the bell being rung at the Drennan Springs Chapel as the Drennan Christian Church meets there. So good morning, everyone. Glad you're here. If you're joining us online, whether you're live right now at 11 a.m. or watching it on a recording afterwards on YouTube or Facebook, I'd like to invite everyone to start this worship service by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. Let's say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And that's the statement of our faith and our belief right there. And anyone is welcome to join us in that at any time. Into our announcements for today of what we have going on. Obviously, this is the second straight Sunday we have met online only. And as of today, the folks that we went on quarantine for, you know, including our household, are done with that. So we'll be moving about the country. And I can tell you in our household, we are ready for that. And we know some other folks we love very much that are ready for that too. So our plan is to get back to business tomorrow. And we'll start with softball games. This week, Drennan plays Monday and Thursday, weather permitting. We've had two straight weeks of rain outs or heat outs. And this is the final week. So tomorrow night, I believe we play at 615 against our brothers and sisters in Christ from Frankleton Baptist Church. And then we play Thursday night, I believe at 815, against the Friends of Southeast Christian Church, some Henry Countyans that happen to worship in the Grange at Southeast, play at 815. And then Saturday we have a tournament that begins at 9 a.m. and will run much of the day till early mid-afternoon. So if you love being at softball games, come be part of that. So anyway, that's this week. We are not going to have our Bible study this um, Wednesday night, we're going to take a week to get back to that, a week off. So we'll start the Spiritual Warfare is Real Bible Study on uh, Wednesday, September 1st. So no Wednesday night this week. Other things that we do have going on, um, you may or may not have heard that the Emmaus Walks have been canceled for this fall, but are already planning their dates in March, and I'm advertising that as possibly the last Emmaus Walks as we know it, because the United Methodist Church that presides over that is splitting in their denomination this coming fall, and so we will, um, they'll have to reevaluate what the whole program's about. So I would love for all of those folks that are good candidates for that retreat weekend to go this spring. They are, the dates are in March, and they'll be in our church bulletin next week, so I'll be asking a lot of you to be part of that. And we'll get back to our normal help center date in September and need to remind you to continue to bring in canned goods and other uh, foods for Awake Ministries and for the help center. Get those things in so we can be part of the community of sharing together from our bounty that we've been blessed with. Thank you again, Walter. Vicki Feller and Walter Fields did serve with that ministry um, a week and a half ago down at the church and from Eminence where they go get that and really appreciate that. We'll be looking for volunteers for that uh, when we get back to church. Uh, this coming Sunday, a big thing as we come back to worship at the chapel, we are scheduled to have creek baptisms. We've done that twice in the last month or so. And we have two more, Phil and Trisha Bays, a newlywed couple, came forward at uh, the end of worship a few weeks ago, and all the schedules have aligned for August 29th, and that's when the date was already set for next Sunday. It wasn't going to work out this past Sunday the 15th, or today the 22nd. Worked out well that uh, we'll be in the house of the Lord on the 29th, and they've confirmed to me just today that they're ready for that. Uh, other things that we'll be getting going, we were planning to have a youth event and a youth breakfast that were supposed to be last weekend. We'll be rescheduling those, getting them on the docket ASAP. 
as soon as we can so people can get back to that, getting back to our Wednesday nights with our Bible study and seeing when we feel comfortable to have the meal with that as well. We want things to be happening for sure. Uh, a men's outing, uh, we, we're running out of season of the Reds, so there's a couple more dates, a couple more Saturday nights that that we can have a men's trip there, so hopefully that'll happen. I know that the ladies are wanting to maybe have a book study this fall, is that right, Harriet? So that's not been taken much further than just the planning stages. And also speaking of that, there'll be the local uh, Agrarian Literary League program that we've been a part of three different times. We'll be uh, giving out free copies of one of Wendell Berry, our local author's best books, Fidelity, and would love to have interested parties if they want to be part of a discussion group at our church or at another location just through our church. Those are a lot of things going on. Oh, one last thing, September 11th, a couple of weeks away, uh, Men's Breakfast. We'll have that on September 11th, 9 a.m. at Lawson's. Lots going on. So we'll be getting back into schedule. And I'll tell you, we have missed being around you guys. We've been more or less around this house for two weeks. And uh, that's tough. I did set out a week of school, even though I technically didn't have to, but chose to quarantine because of illness in the house. And I'll be going back tomorrow. A lot of people are going back to work and school tomorrow. So that's it. We're ready to get back on the horse and get back into life, and we're ready for it. Now, I go to our prayer time. There's, there's a lot we need to lift up, and uh, many of you know that already. Besides the fact that we've had folks quarantining for COVID, the ones that have had that have been uh, some not sick at all, some a little bit sick, and we're talking about simply two families, and then basically everybody's good and ready to go. But besides that, we need to know that COVID-19 is not the only illness that exists. We have folks that are legitimately sick with other things that are very serious. We have two individuals that are in the hospital right now. We need to pray for them desperately. One is for Brenda Banta, who has been in the hospital three times, uh, was taken back last night, and the report today, just minutes ago, was that things are getting better this time. Now, we have had some hijinks with uh, her hospital stays with miscommunication from staff and have not helped her get better. But with the help of her granddaughter who is an RN and just everybody trying to get the point across, looks like that this hospital stay is gonna get her back into uh, better health. So we need to pray for Brenda and pray for Ron. Ron has desperately done his best to serve his sweet bride of 58 years and to help her get on the mend, but it's been hard because a lot of the time he's felt like he's had no voice at the hospital and that uh, no one has ears for what they have to say. This time we think we're good. So pray for Brenda, pray for Ron and the whole family that's been affected by it. Also Norman Sharp, if you've been keeping up, uh, I know that Andrea, Norman's daughter, keeps us updated on Facebook and we talk to her or somebody in the family, Troy, or, or any of them just about every day about updates. and. Norman has had a fiasco. He was going in for a very uh, simple cancer surgery Wednesday a week and a half ago, and it's turned into four or five procedures because of simply mishandling on the part of the hospital. And uh, there have been lots of ups and downs. We hope that things are on the uptick now. This shouldn't have happened this way. It should not have. Norman needs your prayer. So does his wife Janice and all the extended family. Andrea and Troy and their kids and their, their kids' spouses and their grandkids. They need your prayer because this has been a 24-7 thing. Need prayers also for Michael Moe Razor, who has gone back in for a couple of different appointments this week for just uh, some irregularities. And we're hoping that uh, they'll get that under control with medication. And we're hoping for no more recurrences of any kind of cancer cells. But Right now, it's a bunch of tests. So Mo needs our prayers. He's, he's certainly felt up and down, and he's had very good days. He's had some days not so hot, and that's led to these appointments. So prayers for Mo Razor. Just need prayers as uh, the two families that have been affected by COVID-19 get back into life. 
today and tomorrow. And just a phrase that, that nobody's had to be hospitalized or anywhere near that, and that some have not even gotten sick with that. But we've wanted to be good stewards of our church and not um, make anybody feel like we shouldn't have been open when, when folks like ourselves were at worship two weeks ago today and then had positive cases in the house. So. What, what's terrible about any of this this past year and a half is that anytime it seems people have those uh, positive results or tests, rumors fly. One of our sweet members of the church texted us the other day that one of their friends said, we heard the entire church at Brennan tested positive for COVID-19. Ridiculous. We had two or three folks test positive, and there you go. And so I don't think we're that small a church. We've been averaging around 60, and last time I checked, that's well over 50, 55 to 60 people not having it. So we're hoping that if any more cases occur, that we can see that they're coming beforehand and folks uh, quarantine away and not have to close church. We haven't closed it for a year. It's been almost a year to this week that we last closed the church for any COVID-19 positives at all. Now, we've had other positives, but they've been folks that have seen it coming just by being ill, staying out of church. So, I'd like to say this as we go back to worship next Sunday. I said on the one call now that you hear about this is that come back if you're comfortable coming back. Come back if you're well. Come back if you're not sick. If you feel under the weather in a way that's not an ordinary pattern for you, stay home. And please let us know about that so we don't worry about you, so that we know what you're up to. A piggyback with that is as we come back next Sunday, I want you all to respect other space. And with that respecting of space, I would like it to be that, you know, if, if you approach a family that you don't see throughout the week, just see how, how they want to be approached, especially if they have young ones. We have babies right now, folks under a year old, and I know everybody wants to go grab them because you want to eat them up. And we are blessed right now with some beautiful boys and beautiful girls in that church. But please respect mama and mama and everyone else by not doing that. Don't go grab them. Don't put them in, in the pressure of saying, sure, yeah, you can hold my baby. Because we have sweet mothers that don't want to come. We have really sweet mothers that, um, either would probably rather not come and be faced with that dilemma or would feel very awkward because they don't want to seem unfriendly. So you be proactive and say, hey, I'm going to love on that baby from a distance. I'm going to blow kisses at that baby, make eyes at that baby, and let the mama hold it. And that's, we just think that's a safer bet right now and a better loving choice for folks not to feel like they are um, pressured in any way. One last uh, prayer request before we have another praise is for Helen Harden. Um, she had been dealing lately um, with a recurrence of a spot on her ankle. This has been a long time since she really had that, 10 years ago that she was ailing with that. She had to be hospitalized the other night to try to clear that up. And have open a little, wound. Yeah, just, just an open wound on her ankle that needed to be addressed, got a little infection. so. Say prayers for Helen. It's been hard. She went in to, uh, to rehab for a while, did very, very well. But coming back home, you don't have quite the same 24-7 around-the-clock attention and care. And uh, Deborah and the family are doing all they can. And it's hard. As a lot of you all are caregivers, you know that. It's very hard to be there all the time. Uh, praise we have is if you saw on the Facebook uh, page we we put a link to a, a sweet little video it was about five seconds long the other day Harold Barton JR's uh, birth dad who's been down at the church twice this summer we just baptized them uh, a couple of weeks ago Harold got to ring the bell Yay. ringing that bell in chemotherapy and now the good part begins hopefully getting him beefed back up and fattened up and strengthened up so he can go back to work the hope is to be back at the plant where he works in September. And September's going to be here in a minute. So, praise for him with that. And prayers for him and Trish that he can get built back up. Because he wants to go to work. He does not want to sit on the couch. Um, unfortunately, we've had a year and a half of a lot of people in America have decided sitting on the couch is the way to do things. That's not Harold. He wants to be working. 
and uh, producing. So prayers for Harold and Trish as they go back in that. Harriet, have we had any uh, prayer requests sent and into not, the... Um, you know, a lot of people are on this morning, which is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks like we have a visitor in the house, Darwin Tipton. Cool. And uh, Jean Miskell. And, and all of our, um, of course, uh, uh, Trish and Harold are on. Sandusky, Ohio. Uh huh. And uh, so it's our regular members, a lot of them. Sunday, I'm glad you're all here. Yeah, and just remember, it's easier for us to see that you're there if you just make a comment, we're here, or good morning, or happy Sunday. Sometimes we can see it'll say, Trish Martin is here. Sometimes it won't, and we won't know that you're there until, well, ever. <coughs> until, well, I said, Jack Brown, my cousin is on. We would have loved to come last night to watch yeah, him play. Yeah, Jack Brown and his band Smoking Guns were playing last night, and it seems to always work out that we either have a reason we can't come, like, you know, stay in the house for another commitment, so... We'll get there eventually. We will. All right. Well, um, we're going to say prayer for these prayer needs right now. So wherever you are watching. Oh, Harriet. Um, Sam, mm -hmm. we're closing on our house Monday. Please pray for no surprises there and smooth sailing. Because so they're officially now because you know, they've been drawn on their loans and stuff to, to actually build their house. And now they're actually going to close and make it theirs. Wow. So it's a uh, beautiful house. Yeah. And beautiful it is property. Lovely, lovely. Yes. Yeah, prayers and praises because that the Leachman family has done this as much as possible yeah. with their own uh, backbreaking work, yeah. uh, including Troy, including Patrick, including everybody, uh, mm -hmm. pitching in, uh, painting walls, and putting up trim, and bringing in uh, cabinetry, everything. Yep. And it's a beautiful spot. And for them to be able to say, This is ours. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, no hiccups there. Huge for this beautiful young family. So, yes. And Adrian Lee's um, sister will be having a, like a double surgery on Wednesday. So, Charlotte. Yes. So, let's pl pray for Charlotte as she goes to that surgery. And I, I don't think Adrian is going. She thought she might travel there, but I'm not sure whether she is or she isn't. But anyway, right. Let's pray for um, Charlotte. Right. Yeah. That. that. Surgery has been coming. We know it's been on the calendar for a while. It's here. It's time. And also for Bruce. As he goes Bruce Robertson has a surgery, um, really a follow-up from a surgery a few years ago. It's Wednesday. Wednesday has a surgery, so um, Bruce will be on the shelf, and boy, he hates it right now because we're right in that final week of softball, and uh, he'll miss. If we get to play tomorrow, he'll get to play. But after that, he's, he's on the shelf for a good while with that. So prayers for Bruce Robertson. And also Lauren, uh, we found out she's going to have a surgery. No, I don't think she too. is. She's just saying that her knee's bothering her. I don't know if she's going to have surgery. I think I'm well, I hope not. If, if so, pray, prayers for that, yeah. Lauren. But if there's ways to, to tackle that without surgery, I know that's preferred. I'm sure it's preferred. There's someone, uh, Sue Bulgary, uh, just praying hard for Brenda Mom. Yeah, uh, they need it, and sounds like this might be the, the right yeah. setting. Lauren said no surgery. <laughs> no surgery, Lauren, yes. Bruce is like, me too, please. No, Bruce got to go. He got to go. All right. Well, that's the beauty of being able to have something like this on Facebook that we can communicate. I know that the description of having church online with a camera in our parlor, it, the words out of my mouth are super lame, yes, but it's better than nothing right now. We'll take super lame over zero. Well, let's pray. Lord, we pray for those brought forth today. We have a lot. We, we pray for those folks that have had to isolate or quarantine and, and stay away from work or school or, or just from life for the last couple of weeks. We praise your name, though, that we've, we've come through unscathed. And uh, once again... Try to <coughs> this ridiculous virus that has impacted so many lives, uh, including a lot of lives that haven't been sick with it, but it's like everything has to stop because of it. Lord, take that away. Take that away. I'm so sick of that. Lord, we also pray for um, Charlotte Light that will be having her surgery this week on Wednesday, as well as Bruce Robertson having his surgery on Wednesday. Pray for and praises with Victor and Sam Leachman that they're uh, finalizing on their house, uh, beautiful house, beautiful property, just a, really a dream setting 
that well, they can say it's ours. It's ours. We got it. We pray also today for uh, Helen Harden. Get her ankle back in shape. Get that infection out of there so that she can enjoy more freedom, more home. Praises for Harold Barton and prayers that he and Trish can, can beef him up and get him back ready to work. Prayers for Mo Razor as he continues with appointments and tests to, to make sure exactly what's going on with him, uh, with his lungs, and just with his body. Prayers for Norman Sharp with this fiasco that they've been going through on a day-by-day -day basis. Everything changes daily, and it's it's been ridiculous to the point of even having no AC last night at the hospital. That's how ridiculous it's gotten. Lord, deliver that man to hell somehow in spite of this hospital. Get the right people caring for him. Same thing for Brenda Banton. It's been a, a roller coaster. It's been infuriating. Get her well. They're trying so hard. Get the right people using their skills with her. For the rest on our prayer list, be with them as well. Get us back into that chapel. Let us have no more weeks that we ever have to even talk about closing down. Get this behind us. Let us get back to the work of the Lord together, side by side, hand in hand. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, in the fellowship time we would normally have at the church and people see each other and, and run around and, and shake hands and hug and just be around, we can't do that today. I look forward to that next week. Remember everybody's space, but today I'll just say for our fellowship time, if you are on here and have not chimed in with a comment, please do so just so that we know you're there. We miss seeing you all. We've talked with a lot of you this week. We've talked with a lot of you half a dozen times this past week or two because of specific needs that are going on. But it's different not being around you. Mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing some of you all tomorrow night at Harry Hill Park, weather permitting, and uh, throughout the week with that. And then our first uh, meeting at the chapel will be next Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. A special Sunday. Don't miss it if you're healthy and, and ready to be there because we'll uh, once again travel to Dream Creek for uh, the baptism of Phil and Tricia. So the waters are open, and uh, anybody else that's been on the fence about that, you know, like I'm in that water. I've never been baptized or never been baptized by immersion. Come on, join them. Uh, Phil made the comment to me this morning that we'll be he'll be hoisting the softball trophy in the creek. So that's a challenge to our softball team. Get yourself out there this week and do the best you can so that we will be hoisting the Henry County Co-ed Church Softball Trophy next Sunday in Drinning Creek. That would be a cool image. So, Phil, it was your idea. You'll get to, get to hold it. All right, now we go into Holy Communion time. And um, last week I did have someone with the comment, I think, that they were using a pretzel and big red or root beer, one or the other, I think, for their communion time. No, tea. Tea, sweet tea, okay. Sweet tea and pretzel for their communion time. And you know, if we were going with exactly what they had that night, we would probably be having a, a very dry, flat, unleavened bread and some sort of red wine made locally. Now, if that's what you have in your house today, then uh, thank you for reenacting the Lord's Supper. But if it comes down to sweet tea and pretzels, if you're scrambling right now, oh goodness, Corey's talking about communion and I never thought about it. Get yourself something liquid and something bread or cracker-ish and be ready for it. I know that for us today, we have cranberry juice and club crackers. And I'll tell you what, after two weeks of club crackers, we might be thinking about bringing them to the church over that styrofoam stuff to use. Just kidding. But right now, we're going to come forward to that, and on the night that Jesus was betrayed, they were having the Passover feast. It was Passover week, one of the holiest weeks of the year for the Jewish nation. And they had four cups of wine that were shared around the table, community cup. And on the third cup, the cup of redemption. Traditional Jewish feast, Jesus said, this cup of redemption 
is my blood. He had also said right before that that this bread, this Passover unleavened bread, symbolizing when we had to escape quickly, didn't have time for the bread to rise, so unleavened, that is my body. So as we take of the body and blood of Jesus Christ today, let us remember his redemption of us. It's through his sacrifice, his body and blood that we are saved. Not by ourselves. We come to him. We have the choice and the free will to do that. But it's not through us that we are saved. Not through our actions. It's through Jesus Christ, his provenient grace coming upon us, coming into our hearts and calling us to him. Through his sacrifice he did nearly 2,000 years ago for us. So in our household we'll now share. Now we'll give my family the elements. And we'll take them together in a moment. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do pray today over these elements of communion that regardless of if it's an unleavened kosher bread to a pretzel to a noodle to a cracker to a piece of white bread that we know that it symbolizes your body and for the wine whether it is a traditional Jewish Israeli red wine or root beer or Kool-Aid Crane grape juice or big red that we take it as the blood of Christ. We do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's take up the bread together as a church family. Love crackers are very good. And of the juice. Put your comments in there. That is pretty she's exciting it. to me. She's it. Whoa, mind blown. Hmm. Well, that would be good. Uh, for coffee and oatmeal cookie. No fair. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it coming. This is exciting. I have goosebumps. And for having a worship service in our parlor, the Super Lane worship, I love having goosebumps with that. Remember, as we have our offering at church, usually we have it in the front of the building by the door on the table where you collect your communion. While we're gone this week, we do have a post office box if you want to send your tither offering there. It is Drennan Christian Church, P.O. Box 495, Newcastle, Kentucky right <coughs> there, 40050. And now we're going to share the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <coughs> Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly <coughs> host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And Lord, we do thank you for the feast today whether it's peach tea, whether it's oatmeal cookies, whatever it might be. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about what we used, cheese it or red wine. It's about the body and blood of Jesus. Let us focus on that today and every day. It's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Now come in the time that I'll share a message with you all and the title of what I have straight from Scripture, this is from Matthew chapter 12, is whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is a quote Jesus said in the red letters, and um, it is from Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, and I'll read the story around it, the context around it. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is a time of division this past year and a half for sure, and we felt it this week. As, as Harriet reminded me just a few minutes ago, when you have one of your 
favorite church folks, we have about 60 or 70 of you tied for favorite, text us and say, hey, the rumor's out there that the entire Drennan Church tested positive for COVID. Well, that feels like division. Now, I hope and pray that that friend of our church family was just concerned and like, whoa, what, this is crazy. But if not, we're talking division. And you know that over this year and a half of this pandemic or shamdemic or scamdemic or whatever you'd like to call it, because there's been a lot of uh, hijinks and hanky-panky, and I'm saying that as someone who was sick with it about a week and a half ago. Anyway, there's been a lot of poor reporting. And so much has gone in the face of the church and against the church and to the point where people don't know which end is up. We tried desperately to do the loving choice, as we quoted uh, a couple of weeks ago when we decided to close down for two weeks, when one of our board members and elders said, well, the only loving choice we have is to close down for a couple of weeks. Now, we had someone else tell us just this past weekend that we, they know of churches in Henry County that have kept on meeting when folks have been sick and, and in the church. Now, that's their choice, and, and I'm not really concerned about it too much. I hate not meeting. Now, I felt like saying something like, well, son of a gun, when we had these positive cases come, because just a week prior to that, I was praying and reading scripture and planning for the weekend and, and saying something to the effect of, Lord, I hope we come through the rest of this mess unscathed, that we don't have to close the church again, that we don't have to make any decisions like that, and then, son of a gun, we had to. And it almost made me laugh, except it almost made me cry, too, because I hated it. To do it and have to have those discussions with folks and we've had a lot of encouragement from you all with that with folks that called us from day one of this all the way to last night even of like you know there's nothing we could have done nothing we could have done but that because you all were in the church and folks were around each other and best if we do that but i don't want anyone to look at anything happening in the church at Drennan as scattering. When Jesus says, whoever does not gather with me scatters, he's talking about the Great Commission. He's talking about the world and his mission is to gather as many into the kingdom as possible. Jesus only ministered out loud and in the open three or four years. It's not a long time. It's the most momentous three or four years ever in human history or spiritual or cosmic history. But he has left us the task after he ascended to heaven once again to gather alongside him. We cannot afford to scatter by allowing the world to tell us, no, no church. I can't tell you how many people have asked us in the last two weeks, What'd you get it at church? That's what the world has been conditioned to say. A year and a half ago, a man that I don't admire very much at all, our governor, Andy Bashir, started the conversation about COVID-19 by asking churches to stop meeting this weekend. He didn't ask anybody else to stop meeting. Heaven forbid he'd ask anybody that does have scandalous behavior to stop meeting. He asked the churches to stop meeting. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. And I would turn that around and say, whoever scatters does not gather with me. So for us to hear in phone calls from innocent folks, friends, family, oh, did you get that at church? That's a conditioned response by the world, by the media, by some of our government to say, well, COVID, the Rona, lives in the church. I don't know if we'll ever be able to track down where it came from, and I don't care to. I hope and pray that nobody in our church family or our immediate family or in this community that I see people driving by right now gets that virus that I think we know originated by ill-gotten gains overseas for bad reasons. I hate that my son and my wife were sick with that for a short while. I hate that 
we've been divided to the point where uh, are you vaccinated or not? And that's the first question out of the mouth. We need to gather together and not scatter. I've heard so much, though, from you all by phone call, by text, by Facebook, of love, of concern. If we took up everybody on their offer to drop us a casserole or some other dish on our porch, our porch would be gone. It would sink into the ground with that many people offering things and just the encouraging phone calls and the like. Gifts. Gifts. Yeah. Got a gift on our porch last night. Thank you, dear church member, for that. Beautiful. Let me read you this story, the context about what Jesus was talking about when he said, whoever does not gather with me scatters. This starts in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 up to 37. If you have your own Bible or your own device that you'd like to read it on, get that out. Yours might sound different from mine. I'm reading from the NIV right now, and there's plenty of translations that work for your style. The subheading of this section in my Bible says Jesus and Beelzebub. That should tell you what this is about, light and dark. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? So after the first paragraph of this story, what's happened is a man was possessed by the devil. He couldn't see, he couldn't talk. Jesus healed what was wrong with him and the people saw and believed. Could this be the son of David? And for the Jewish people of that time, that was the anointed one, the Messiah, the one prophesied. Next paragraph. But when the Pharisees, folks in charge of the church, Heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Immediately, the synagogue, the church, says, No, sir. He's driving out demons in the name of the devil. Not very logical. We'll get to what that means in a moment. Jesus knew their thoughts. And said this to them. So he knew immediately what they were doing, what they were thinking. And the rest of the story are the words of Jesus. He said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Now I'll say that right now about our country of America and about the church in America. If our kingdom, let's say the United States of America, is divided against itself, it'll be ruined. I'm 50, almost 51. And I dare say in my few short years on this earth, I've never felt such division in America as this last year and a half. Now, some of you might say, well, buddy, you weren't alive when this happened or you were too young to remember this thing. And I understand it. I understand it. I'm saying in my context of 50 years, this year and a half of division has felt like a, a giant rift in America. Every city or household divided against itself will not stand. I'll take that more to a local level. At church, our church happens to be the one that meets at the Drennan Springs Chapel built in 1862. Drennan Springs, Kentucky. We'll say that's our city, our household. If we're divided against ourselves, we will not stand. There have been lots of ways that we can divide ourselves over this last year and a half. And we've, we've hit bumps in the road. We certainly have. With different opinions or different reactions or ugly words to one another over how we can get through this mess. I think progress has been made over that year and a half, including quite recently, um, in how we see the need as a church family to unite. Now, just as I say that, just as we have some wonderful things occur with our baptisms, with our musical guests we've had, with our board meeting we had right before we had to close down, I will say that, of course, just as you have progress, just as you have growth,
just as you have new membership and new belief and mountaintop experiences, you also get those challenges. For us, a giant challenge has been closing down uh, meeting for two Sundays and a few Wednesdays and some Mondays and Thursdays at softball. That's a big challenge. A bigger challenge, though, in my mind is the fact that we have folks in the hospital. Folks that are honestly sick. Are we together or are we divided? I pray that we're together. After Jesus has said these things, he says, concerning what they said about the elves of old, he said, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He is saying to the Pharisees right now, you say that I'm driving out demons by a demon. I'm driving out the devil by the devil. How's that work? You're crazy, Pharisees. The devil doesn't want to drive out himself. Even he wants to be in alignment with himself. Beelzebul, the prince of demons, does not want to drive out demons. So you're saying, I'm using the devil to drive out the devil. <clears throat> Makes real good sense, Pharisees. He says, on the other hand, if I'm driving out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. From there he says, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions... Unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. And in reading and researching on this, because that's a very cryptic text, I wondered who's this talking about. I went to Matthew Henry, who was a great theologian of the 19th century, and he's saying this house they're talking about, Jesus is mentioning, is the devil. The devil is in charge of the world right now, and so Jesus has had to come into that house, the world, and tie up the devil and cast out the demons and take over in the name of God to deliver people from that. So as in the beginning of this story, Jesus has given a blind and mute man sight and speech. He has had to subdue demons to do that. He has had to go into the stronghold of the devil, subdue the devil, and do the work of God. The Pharisees, I'm sure at this point, are boiling hot mad. They've said, Jesus, you're working in the power of the devil, mainly because he wasn't working under their authority. Next part of the story is the quote I share with you. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, you've probably heard the only unpardonable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I'll go into that in a moment. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, uh, many of you have heard the quote that the only unforgivable sin is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And boy, that's a tough text, isn't it? People have grown up in different Christian denominations and traditions thinking, well, is what I did the unpardonable sin? I killed someone. I neglected my family. I ran around on my wife. I went into the oblivion of addiction. Those things, were those the unpardonable sin? Well, I sure hope not, because I'm standing here in front of this cell phone leading a Facebook Live in the church knowing that I've done awful things that I can't fix, I can't repair by myself. If it were based on being unpardonable, unsavable, based on the sins I've committed, then no, well, I'm done. And I hate to say it, so is my wife and my son, because we've all sinned. There's nobody, any of you have ever met, or yourself, who is without sin. Jesus says in here, you can even slander Jesus himself and get by. Now, I went back to Matthew Henry again, this great old theologian from the 19th century, and thought, wow, that's, that's wild. And what he wrote about this was the fact that depending on the context of where they lived and in the time of Jesus, there were a lot of 
good, honest folk that did not accept Jesus at that time because of how he was presented by the Pharisees and by the folks that were Jewish at that time. And, and right now, there might be people that are uh, living in a context where they do not understand who Jesus is. They've not heard the right story. They've heard false stories. But the difference with the Holy Spirit is this. Think about what you perceive as the Holy Spirit. A way I've often looked at it to describe it in the Trinity is God in heaven, Jesus on earth, and the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Our salvation comes from a belief in the heart, a faith, a trust that you experience in your heart and that you live for Him. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and turn your life over to Him, you have the Holy Spirit coming inside of you. In Acts chapter 2 and 3, it goes into that original church and the coming down of the Spirit upon the believers so that we have that. If you do not feel like anything ever changed in your heart or in who you are when you came up that aisle at, at Drennan Church or any other church, you feel no change and you've not changed anything in your life, then I would ask you to come and talk with me about that. Because perhaps, like a lot of folks that I've talked to in the last 12 years, they come to me and said, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. When I came up that aisle or came up to that creek or went down at that uh, youth retreat or at that uh, revival, I went because the crowd went. I went because I knew my mama wanted me to. But I, I didn't know anything. And perhaps you've never felt that Holy Spirit come into your heart. Or you could have said that you were saved for ill-gotten reasons. Um, we had a, a horrible incident that two of our loved ones here, Chris and Heather, had to be witness to an awful crime uh, in Shelbyville the other night. And we're talking about the victims of that crime, and they said that the, the young lady that was a victim of crime knew the Lord, had been recently baptized, and really tried to hunker down and learn about Jesus, whereas the, the, the man involved in the crime knew his Bible backwards and forwards, but you could tell that was as far as it went. Maybe that's where you've been in your life. So for Jesus to say the only unforgivable sin is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, to me that says... The only unforgivable sin is not taking the Holy Spirit into your heart because you do not believe. You do not want that change. You do not welcome Jesus to bring the Holy Spirit into you as a believer in Christ. Instead, you're saying, no, no. Even if you're part of a church, even if you've gone in the Drennan Creek or any other waters of baptism, even if you participate in the life of the church, but you have held your heart away from Him, and you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You're saying, no, there's no place in my heart for a Holy Spirit. And of course, here Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees, is pointing out to them the nature of their hearts. Last paragraph he has in this story. He comes back and says, Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Are you producing fruit? You brood of vipers, he says to the Pharisees. How can you, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So I beg of you right now, as I said, whoever does not scatter, gather with me scatters, is that you will be outed in the end for who you are. It said earlier in the story that Jesus knew their thoughts. 
He knew the Pharisees' thoughts. He knew what was going through their head. He knows through all of our heads. He knows exactly what's going on. So he knows the state of your heart, the state of your salvation. He knows the state of my heart, my salvation. And it will prove true. If what is in your heart is evil and vile and dirty, that is what you will produce. You will not produce fruit that resembles Jesus. You will produce rotten, putrid fruit that is dead on the vine. Now, churches are not built to be a museum for saints. They are not built to house people that have gotten things right completely and live a sinless life. Because that's not who we are. We are on earth. Someday when we get to go to heaven and we worship all day long every day, we don't have to have a house of the Lord to contain it because the law will be in worship all the time. We will not have the power to sin. We will not have the capability to experience sadness or death or darkness at all. We'll be entirely light all the time. But until then, while we're here, we have to know where we stand and work at it every day. Now, we're not working towards a salvation, because if we did, we'd all fail. Most religions, besides Christianity, are built on a hierarchy system of how well you're doing. I'm doing this well, so I'm going to get this much in heaven. I'm doing this. I better turn it up a little bit so I can get there. No. But what I will ask you to work on is what is the nature of your heart? If your heart has not been enslaved by the Holy Spirit, taken over by the Holy Spirit, and changed from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, as it says in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 36, then I would challenge you to learn more about his ways. The book that I have in front of me, the Holy Bible, tells about that. Being in a church weekly and more leads to that. Being in the study of the Bible in a group like we have on most Wednesday nights leads to that. Filling your head with the right things as you drive to work, what you listen to on the way, what you talk about with your family, the things you look at on your phone, the way you spend your time with the TV. You can very easily be influenced away so that you close that heart away from the Holy Spirit so that you blaspheme the Holy Spirit as you say, no, no, I can say I'm a Christian, I can be baptized, I can be part of a church, I can serve on a committee, whatever, but I'm not giving you my heart. <clears throat> you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But someone who is in the midst of sin and darkness and despair and loneliness and feeling like they have no other way but they calls out, Lord, come into my heart, help me. I'm at the end of my rope. That person has more in common with Jesus than the one sitting in the church and thinking and doing and feeling nothing. Now, does that mean I don't think you be, need to be in the church? Absolutely not. Don't believe the awful things you see on Facebook that say being in a church doesn't make you any more of a Christian than being in a garage makes you a car. Please. Good luck if you're on your own trying to serve Christ isolated away from other like-minded believers. You know, as we've lived in a pretty much kind of an isolation the last two weeks here, we have felt cut off. It's felt like a lot longer than two weeks in many ways because we've not been around you, who we love to be around. Talking on the phone is one thing. Being around you and feeling your touch and seeing your face and just being in the presence of one another, that does it. So I ask you, do you gather or do you scatter? I pray that at Drennan Christian Church we gather in the name of Jesus, not in the name of Drennan. We do not scatter. If we scatter, then we're not doing anything in the name of Jesus. We're doing things in the name of ourselves. And we can't have that. Today, um, I'm going to leave us with a hymn. Last week, I, I had a hymn for us that was from... Tim Menzies, and I, I pulled it from the worship service we had at the end of July where we had our first baptism week of the year, and, and we sang the old rugged cross. This week, I pulled from uh, when Alvarado Roadshow came on August the 8th, and um, 
no, August 1st, excuse me, and we had a really good time with them. And one of the songs we sang was Nothing But Blood. So we're going to share that song together now. Sing this at home. This recording is, of course, them with us. So you might hear your voice. You might hear my voice, my goodness. You might hear a baby. We can sing together. Nothing But the Blood by Alvarado Roadshow and the Drennan Church family. This is our hymn of invitation. Got you all clapping. Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Other found I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hope and praise, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nice to have a guitar solo. One of our favorite parts about Alvarado. away my sin nothing but the blood of Jesus what can make me whole again nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus, but the blood of Jesus, nothing but the bl blood All right. Y'all remember we won't have a Wednesday night this week. We'll meet back together at the grounds of the chapel and the fellowship hall next Sunday for our first time up. If you want to see each other out and about, then, hey, we got softball games coming out of our ears this week. Monday, one game. Thursday, one game. Saturday, hopefully five or six games to get that championship. So come see each other there. We'll have our closing prayer as I hear our little clock. Lord, deliver us back safe to the Drennan Springs Chapel. Get us back together, healthy. Be with those that are right now just anxiously awaiting to get back together. Be with those that have been away, 
feeling better, ready to move about the country. Be with those that are hospitalized right now, especially those that would like nothing better than to be home and to be doing things they love to do. Lord, bless this church family of Drennan Christian Church that we love so much. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We'll see you all this week.